Okay, so um, I am one of the one out of 10 of the summer engagement fellows for um, race and the American story. And so for my three part zoom series, um, it's called queer black and invisible and I really kind of wanted to um, look at queer identities, um, that intersection with being black um, and what that looks like in the queer community and what that looks like in the black community um, and just what that conversation looks like um, and kind of how that history has been recorded or how there is a lack of that history being recorded. Um, so all of the Zoom sessions will be more um, discussion based. Um, on the readings or the films that we watch. Um, so we'll be watching three films throughout this series. The first one that was supposed to be watched was The Life and Death of Marsha P. Johnson. Um, there was also clips sent and an article sent. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, and then we'll also be talking about intersectionality just so we can really understand how we're having the conversation um, and terminology in regard to the conversation. Um, yeah, did that all make sense to everyone? That was a lot, sorry. Okay, cool. So um, what we're gonna do first is kind of talk about intersectionality and what that means um, so that we're all talking about the same thing when we say that. Um, so can anyone, does anyone, can I get like three people to kind of give me a definition of what they feel intersectionality is um, and what that means? Sure, I can go. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm Anusha. I'm the other um, Race and American Story Fellow, but um, I actually attended a session on intersectionality last week, so I got a better idea of what that is. But I, to me, it's just like um, intersection of different components of your identity, whether if it's like your sexuality, race, and religion, and like how that plays a role in shaping your identity and experiences. Cool, cool. Thank you, Anusha. Anybody else? Nope. Oh, Aisha. Nope. Bingo. Okay. Um. So. Whenever I was looking into this, I thought it was really important because I feel like intersectionality, the term and the concept is used so broadly for everything. Um, and so I do want us to ha all have one understanding of what it is, whether it be my definition, whether it be your definition or whatever the case. Um, and so what I think intersectionality is, um, is the idea that you have intersecting identities that are oppressed simultaneously. And so I, when I was looking into um, when Krim Kimberly Crenshaw had originally coined this term, um, she was talking in regards to the case of a woman who felt that she was discriminated against because of her race and simultaneously discriminated against because of her gender. Um, and the courts really didn't understand that. Um, and that is why Kimberly Crenshaw had originally coined the term um, because black women we're discriminated against in different communities at the same time for different things, which is something that um, I guess would be considered kind of unique to us um, because white women go in spaces and they're discriminated against because of gender, but not race. Um, black men go in spaces and are discriminated against because of race and not gender. And so um, that's kind of how I feel about intersectionality. Does anyone have any comments on that? Um, or anything. No. Nope. I yes. think you're right. Okay, go on, Dr. Langley. No, go, no, go on, Dr. Sean. I can, I can come next. <laughs> okay, no, I was just going to say, I, I just love that point so much that you just raised. I think that this term has been co-opted, like so many other things have been co-opted from the, from the, um, the, the rootedness of the term. And I think your, your um, intention to point us to the direction of the oppressions, those identities that are oppressed, is something that we should keep in mind when we think about intersectionality. So 
Anusha was not wrong. Um, it's, it's just that we want to make sure that on our understandings of, of identity when it comes to intersectionality is, are the understandings that those, those um, different axes that create our, our identities are axes that put us at the bottom of the totem pole. That's where intersectionality comes in as a, as a concept under the, under the um, thinking of black feminism or critical race theory. Um, that's what it is. I think that's absolutely right. I agree. Dr. Langley, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, I love your hat, by the way. Um, no, I, uh, you know what, Scholar? Bassett, you know, you, yeah, it's excellent. I mean, and I think that intersectionality, this is just a comment, is, um, has to grow and expand and develop. And I think that's what you're highlighting for us, right? That the point is that can I bring all of who I am to the table? or make my own table, but can I bring all of who I am into this whatever space I so choose? And that I get to say what that is, right? Uh, if we go back to Barbara Smith, so all the, all the whites are women, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave. And then if we think about, okay, what does that brave look like now, right? And I mean, right, there's even challenges to this notion of our identities or our modes of being, and even as intersecting is it that they're connecting, right? And so, and so whenever it is we bring, we who are at the bottom of the great chain of being, the bottom of the totem pole, I can step into a feminist space, but I can only be a woman and I can only be a woman in a particular way that is described, or I can step into a black space, but I can only be black in a particular way that says I can't bring all of my identities, if it's a queer identity, if it's, you know, if it's, if it's non-binary, in other words, I can't bring all of who I am. So when we think about intersectionality, it certainly is an important, I think, as you highlight, framework for us to begin thinking through this, especially if we think about make it plain. Um, you know, so I'll stop it. Thank you. I have, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Can you, can you all hear me? Uh, I was just saying, like, I appreciated the... Uh, the background of like where the term intersectionality was coined and honestly it's not something that I learned about until college like right around fall 15 and all these different town halls and whatnot and it definitely helped me realize my privilege as a man and then it also allowed me to think about my different identities as far as how me being black but me being a black gay man how those intersect um, and so it's just all that to say is I definitely appreciate the, uh, yes, Kimberly Crenshaw, sorry. I definitely can appreciate you pointing out where it started uh, and just how it allows you to open up your mind to think about how, I mean, your identities play in the factor, like, and ditto to everything Dr. Chanukki, uh, Dr. Langley said, but yes, it's hot in my car, but I wanted y'all to hear me. I'm running out of breath a little bit. Uh, I was going to say also, um, also second thing, fourth thing, everything everyone said. Um, but also, I really think, especially in the current climate, like, it is really important to point out that, like, Kimberly Crenshaw and coining intersectionality is coming from, like, a legal perspective and talking about the ways that the law fails to see um, intersecting experiences as possible um and like that case where she's talking about where like a woman must a black woman must say whether she's discriminated against for being black or being a woman is really like i don't know like the fact that it is this legal precedent and this lead like that is the lens through which intersectionality was coined i think like in the current moment is like also very like it just hits a little different than like you know I don't know, but um, I think there's something about that that I think is really interesting and really important. And I think um, it also adds something to the conversation, yeah. Thank you everyone for those comments um, and dropping that knowledge. Um, and do you want me to call you Dr. Sims or Elena Sims or 
Oh, I'm not a doctor yet, so we're not going to claim okay. that just yet. We're just going to say Elena. That's cool. <laughs> we, we will claim it. We will claim it. <laughs> we're going to claim it in the prayers, but I, I we can't be saying that out loud just yet. <laughs> Um, so I do want to thank Elena for her comments um, and about how really it is a legal term. Um, and so I wanted to I really thank her for that point, because when we're speaking about this specific case of Marsha P. Johnson um, and those film, um, this is more it's a legal issue, a political issue, a social issue. But like as far as intersectionality is much so a legal issue um, and how that was handled and how that was seen. Um, and so I also think just thinking about intersectionality in this conversation, um, the film also talks about what it is to kind of be white and queer versus black and queer, um, what it means to be cisgender versus trans. Um, and so I really just want us to think about those things in the way that we're having conversation because not everything is intersectionality. Um, and so I do want everyone to try and practice using the term kind of like, I guess, intersecting identities um, or identities simultaneously, um, but just be careful using the term intersectionality, um, because I do think that can change the dynamic of the conversation and the way that we're having conversation. Um, so yeah, that's really all I wanted to say about that part. Um, sorry. Um, so now we're going to move on to some discussion questions um, about the film specifically. Um, and so what I want us to do, and I kind of forgot to do inter introductions at the beginning. I'm a little nervous. Um, but I want everyone to do a one word flash of the film. And so what that means is just saying one word about how you feel about the film. Um, whether that be upset or whether that be good or whatever the word is, just one word. Um, and before you do that, can everyone say their name, their pronouns, and either like their major occupation or something kind of on how they're related to this conversation and like joining this conversation. Um, so I can go first. So I'm Kiesens. Um, I use she or they pronouns. I go to the University of Missouri. My one word is conflicted. And then we can go to Dr. Langley. Dr. Langley, she, her pronouns, um, faculty in English and Black Studies, Chair of Black Studies, pain. I'm Hannah. I also go to the University of Missouri and one word I would use for the movie is moving. I'm Isis. I use she and her pronouns. Um, I'm not in the University of Missouri as well. And my word was frustrated. Mackenzie, you're next. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, my name is Mackenzie. I use she or her pronouns. Um, I'm also a student at the University of Missouri, and my word for it would be impactful. Hi, y'all. My name is Yasmin. I use she or her pronouns. I'm a student at the University of Missouri, and my word was also moving. Um, oh, wait, I'm off mute. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tamita Shivam. I use she or her pronouns. Uh, my one word would also be conflicted. Hi, my name is Bailey. I'm from the University of Missouri. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and my word was also frustrated. Hi, everyone. My name is Keenan. I'm a senior at Mizzou. I use he, him pronouns. And my one word would be questioning. Hi, I'm Andrea. I go to Mizzou. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And my word to describe the film would be blueprint. Hi, my name is Michaela. I also go to the University of Missouri. I use she, her pronouns. And my word is probably like history.
Hi, um, I'm Aisha. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm at uh, Mizzou right now, um, MCC. Um, and my word would be, um, yeah, I like the uh, question, question, thinking. Hi, everyone. I'm Yelena. Um, I am a soon to be doctoral candidate at UMass Amherst in African American studies. Um, I think my word would also be conflicted, um, something between conflicted and frustrated. And I don't know if there's a word for that. Um, but yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sydney. She or pronouns. Uh, I go to uh, Mizzou as well. And my word would be um, disappointed. Hi, my name is Kendall. I use she or her pronouns. I also go to Mizzou. Um, and my word to describe the film would be multi layered. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Shanikan. I am at the University of Massachusetts, but moving on to moving back to the University of Missouri. And um, I use she, her pronouns, and my word would be challenged. Hello, everybody. My name is Devante Floyd. I use. Deontay, your sound is going down a little bit. We can't hear you. Is this better? Yeah. This better? Sorry, those those headphones. I was saying my name is Deontay Boyd. I use he, him, his pronouns. Went to Mizzou, and now I work for the, resi the Department of Residential Life. And my one word would be emotional. Hi. Uh, my name is Pooja. I also go to Mizzou. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And I guess the best word would be conflicted. I was like in, like somewhere in between conflicted and moving, um, but I'll lean towards um, conflicted. Awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Anusha. I go by she, her, and hers. Um, I am a student at Arizona State University studying sociology and history. and the one, I guess it's kind of two words, but I thought it was, um, the movie was pretty thought provoking. I'm Kim. I go to the University of Missouri as well. Um, and I, I usually say that I think my word might be complicated. Hi, my name is Alana. I graduated from the University of Missouri. I use she, her pronouns, and I now work at the University of Chicago. Um, my word is activated. Okay, I'm about to send AJ's in the chat. Um, so, yes. Okay. So does anyone want to further elaborate on their word? Maybe like three people? Yes, Mackenzie. So the word that I chose was impactful and I kind of felt it in multiple ways from it. I felt that one, the work that Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and everybody who was a part of the Stonewall movement and the liberation movements that came after it were very impactful both in like the queer liberation space and then society as a whole. Like we even saw in the film with um, Sylvia going all the way to Rome and that impact that she had and Marsha had all across the globe um, and also impactful on a personal sense because it really just brought my focus more into what work am I doing in my work for um, queer people? How am I centering the voices of trans people, specifically trans people of color and also impacted me in a way that it was made me think about what am I going to do when I'm out of school and I have a career and I work in law, hopefully, and how I will center those voices. So. For me, my word was moving because of Victoria Cruz's work that really stuck with me of how she devoted herself to 
bringing justice and kind of um, drawing out that legacy. So I'm older. So the reason I felt pain is because I kept thinking. And I had, you've been doing this for so long. It just seems like we have so well learned how to oppress and silence one another. And um, I saw that um, in, in the pain, at, certainly uh, with regard to the, the worker, the, the people that were really working um, that were just, um, I guess the one thing, the one moment that sticks out is, is uh, Sylvia um, on that stage and saying, you know, I've gone to jail, I've, I've been beaten, all this and you get up here and this is within her own this in her own people i'm going to put it that way within her own nation saying and you have outed me you have ousted me you have put me you've made me an outsider in my own and in the space that i created for you and it reminds me of this sort of painful history of we seem to move one step forward and then oh now we're in this place and so it's uh, people recognize that you know women's rights or or or, or people re recognize the rights of different groups and then saying okay but now I, i'm going to close the door because no not you you don't get to be here and the struggle and at the very end still um it seemed also like and nobody cared about the sex worker nobody cared about the poor the, the poor struggling uh women and and people who were on the streets who were hungry who were like without places like it just seemed there was so much pain in that up until the very end when it was like, you know, um, and this is like my, not my first time saying this, but that there was so much pain at the end and then to come to, I felt really for Victoria Cruz, like there was nowhere to go further, like the law, as we think about the law, this is as far, you know, she comes back and it's like, really, you know that people can find out every single bit of information they want to you know, kill somebody in the street and you're going to tell us about how many times they smoked weed or whatever they did. But all of a sudden, they hear all these facts lining up and it was just a lie and it was really hard and it was really painful. And I put myself in that space and I, and I was just like, it just felt like some kind of doggone middle passage. I mean, it was really painful for me. Um, that's all I'll say. Um, for me, I said conflicted because I liked the film. Um, I liked that it did highlight um, all the good that Marsha did. And it kind of highlighted the like, I don't even really want to say like good parts of her life, but how joyful she was in that, um, regardless of what was going on. Um, and the reason I say conflicted is because on top of that, just kind of after reading the article that I sent out, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but reading the article and also thinking about Sylvia um, and not trying to take away from Sylvia's experience of being trans and how that is an extremely oppressive experience um, and how she was treated and she didn't get murdered and like, she was, in the film, I think it describes her as very um, aggressive in the way that she had said things. Um, and Marsha P. Johnson was not really an aggressive person in the way that she said things. And so kind of just thinking about um, that difference and how it's viewed and kind of what I keep thinking about is like, if Sylvia would have um, gotten murdered um, or anything would have happened to Sylvia, like just kind of the reaction maybe of the cops, which probably wouldn't have been different, um, but just kind of thinking about that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why I feel conflicted, I guess. Um, does anyone have any more comments about their word at all in, in regard to the film? Yeah, can I go? Um, I like kind of on that same vein, I said disappointed just because like obviously the like atrocities that happen against trans people and like women in particular um, is obviously like so egregious, but I felt like on top of that, 
I felt like it was more, and maybe this is on purpose, it was more, like, focused on the inspiration that, like, Marsha P. Johnson left, um, but a lot of those people were, like, not Black trans women, and so I felt like that, like, they didn't center a lot around her, like, life and her activism, um, and maybe that was on purpose, but I would have liked a little bit more just, like, background of, like, you know, what she did, like, what she was like, like, I felt like they did a lot more of that, like, kind of biographical, like, background for, like, Sylvia and Victoria. And even to go off of Sydney's point, um, saying that and, like, thinking about the film and how there were Black trans women in the film, but, like, they were highlighting their deaths um, or not even like them being murdered. And so it makes me think of like, and literally not the same thing at all, but like in the sense of like, when it comes to black people, like our, um, our trauma is highlighted before anything, like thinking about slavery, okay. And there was so much more before that. And so just kind of thinking about um, the way that our narrative is often told um, is through a lens of trauma rather before anything else. And so talking kind of about the lens aspect of the film, um, are there any thoughts about the article? Did that change? Did you read that before or after the film? Um, and if so, did that change how you felt about the film or any thoughts on that? Yeah, I like really felt like everything I just watched was like, I like questioned the whole thing. Like I was like, oh, I don't, I don't believe in the portrayal of this movie. Like I understand like people are telling, saying their voices, but for a white cis man to go in and create this movie when someone had already done this work, like, um, um, I think Raina Gossett, um, you know, had already done this work, already created something. And rather than like use his platform to like create space or like, I don't know, like amplify the already created production. Um, I think it was just like, wow, like I don't really believe, I don't really believe in this storytelling because I'm sure it's not the right way to sell. Like I really wanna see the um, Raina Gossett's film um, just because I feel like that will be, like even though I learned so much from this film, like I'm sure the way I learned it was tainted. Um, and I question anything that's produced people who experience these things and especially people who come out and say that this is okay for me to do, um, who even after being called out, um, stand by um, in their ignorance of, of continuing to produce this kind of work rather than um, give, up the, give up their space and money and time um, to people who have already done it. Um, yeah, my word was conflicted as well. And part of the reason why I was, uh, as I was watching the film and even reading the article and watching the interview that Kiesen sent, um, I felt conflicted because before watching the, the movie or the documentary, there was, um, on social media, people speaking about how this is, um, a cis gay man using his privilege to tell the story of Marsha. And um, I just remember seeing the tweet. So I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna watch it because like, it's not really informing myself in the right way. And in, in from what I've heard from other people in the community. Um, but I specifically remember in the film, there was a part, I don't remember who specifically said um, this, but they said, uh, not word for word, but they were like, um, essentially, um, Marsha, being a Black trans woman, did everything that she could, and now 2015, gay rights um, has been passed in the Supreme Court, and everyone has forgotten about trans people, and that was in the film, or in the documentary made by an individual who quite literally forgot about Black trans women, the people, or the, the individuals who were the ones to fight and start um, pushing for equal rights. So for me, that's why I was very conflicted. Um, and having watched the documentary, I was like, okay, I can see why people are on the fence about supporting one, the, the documentary, but also just the narrative and the perspectives that were presented. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I felt like, well, I read the article first, so I kind of went into the movie a little bit skeptical, but I also kind of felt like it didn't do a lot of justice to Marsha P. Johnson because I felt like we didn't get much about the actual life of her and like her actual work. And like the focus was really heavily on uh, Sylvia, which isn't wrong, but I feel like for the title and the cover, I feel like it was kind of on Marsha P. Johnson's back and not really for her in the way it could have been. Um, and even like with David France, was that his name? I tried to find, because it said in an article that he wrote about her death when she passed. Um, I didn't even see the article. I couldn't find it on the internet. Like, I don't know if it's archived or what, but I just felt like it wasn't as genuine as it she deserved. Kaylin asked the question, do you think the film was intersectional enough? Um, I don't. Um, personally, I don't, and anyone can answer this question. Um, and I, like, I had gotten so many texts um, and DMs about, oh, you shouldn't use this film, and oh, you shouldn't do this, and oh, you shouldn't do that. And I think that, as I said, it was conflicting because it's like, okay, I don't show the film, and then it's not highlighted on, um, and then we don't necessarily talk about or highlight why our stories are being told wrong. Um, and then it's like, if I do show the film, that is traumatic because it wasn't intersectional at all. Um, and the way that it was talking about, um, like it was centered around gayness more than anything. Um, and I think that that's also just like, kind of as far as like language back then is very different from language now. Um, and so, and I think still it was centered around like gayness and like whiteness more than anything as well. Um, but I think it is important to still look at these films and like look at these articles and stuff like that, because if we don't, then it's like, we don't dissect them and we don't talk about them and we still don't have our history. And so, yeah. Does anyone else want to answer Kaylin's question? Well, kind of answering the question, but also kind of a response to you, to, to you, Key Essence. I think that that's like a really important point to bring up, like the focus on, and it's like, it start over there has been a long-standing critique of like the current lgbtq movement to say that it centers white gay men white cisgender gay men as like the face of the movement as the driving force behind the movement you know what i mean and in that does erase a lot of the people of color particularly black trans women that like really truly are the driving forces behind this movement and so i think that you're absolutely right in pointing out that like you know well if we don't engage sometimes with these kind of sources then we don't get to point out that that thing right there that we keep saying is happening but like we have to kind of engage with the examples to be able to pull out the examples later um and um as far as the question like was it intersectional enough i think that like the discussion around like the director the you know the cinematography like what was given more screen time who was given more screen time what kind of facts were prioritized i think that like definitely kind of answers that question as well um and i do think like you said yes since it's important to remember that this is a different point in time like this is we're literally talking about like pre the inception of intersectionality you know what i mean as far as like when the historical events are actually happening um but i do think it's important also to point out that like even though the term had not been coined when the stonewall riots are happening that does not mean that like we know for a fact that black women and black trans women and um Black LGBTQ folk had been talking about something that sounded a lot like intersectionality for like decades at that point. Um, all you got to do is look at an Audre Lorde piece where she goes through real clear and says, this is who I am. You know what I mean? And there's always that list, first page of every Audre Lorde piece. Um, and so I think that, you know, I, I don't want to leave room for like, oh, well, intersectionality wasn't a term like during that historical moment, because I feel like too many people are going to use that as a cop out. 
and be like, well, I ain't got to really reference it. You know what I mean? I can just tell the history. And since the history doesn't involve that word, I ain't got to be concerned with it. Um, and I don't know, I think, but I do applaud your decision to use this particular example, because I think that it does allow us to have this conversation about like, okay, what would a truly intersectional history of this moment look like? Thank you for that comment. Does anyone else have um, any response or anything to what we were talking about? I thought it was really, like, this whole conversation is really interesting, especially when you bring up, whenever you had mentioned earlier that the term intersectionality has been co-opted um, by a lot of different people, especially within, like, the queer community, myself being identifying as white and queer, I see a lot of people around me use the word intersectionality to talk about how, yes, like, they're white, but they're also queer, so they're oppressed, and then we even see in this film the actuality of that like literally showing what intersectionality like actually is like what it is um, like, i'm gonna work oh. <laughs> sorry um what it actually is and also shows at that same time that privilege that like this white filmmaker this white sales filmmaker had to not even recognize that he was taking up that space or even if he did recognize it he just went along with it anyway um, because he said that he was a friend of Marsha, rather than giving that space and actually using, recognizing that yes, he is oppressed in a certain way, yes, these are occurring, but that's not the story, that's not how you tell your actual friend's story, and that's not what she would have wanted. Sorry, this is, okay, so this is supposed to be a really organic conversation, I just want everyone to feel that they can say just for this first one um just because we are talking about history and how it's told so um does anyone have anything that they would like to point out about the article specifically anything from the article or from the um interview um one thing i found to be like especially egregious was that even when the filmmaker was confronted about it he still used his privilege to just write Raina Gossett off with funding. And I thought that that like made it even worse um, on top of everything that he did. I have something else. Um, so like this kind of goes into, I guess what we've been talking about this entire time, but um, in the interview with France um, and Victoria, Cruz, um, he mentioned, he talked about the AIDS epidemic and he mentioned how like there was a whole generation of like men, he used that word specifically to describe like people that had died from AIDS. Um, and so I kind of just thought that that just kind of showed kind of how he had some blinders, like, I don't know, he, his privilege being a white cisgender man um, kind of showed through at that moment, so. Um, something to add on to that as well, I felt like it was almost ironic how, like, a huge part of the movie was talking about how the LGBTQ plus community has forgotten the T. You know, they say, like, there were people who said, like, where's the T? Like, you can't forget about us. And I feel like it's just so ironic that, like, even, 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 he, like, he even made a film about this whole thing in, like, like it's like that point also went over his head as well even though he was like making that film and he like disregards that point even like even after making a film that talks about that so so much and I just yeah that's all just that it was just ironic that he like did the exact thing that so many people in the film were saying was so wrong yeah, I love that point, Hannah. Um, when I was thinking about, well, whenever you said that, um, and I was thinking about that in the film, um, when they were like, everyone's forgetting the tea, and like, everyone writes letters to us. Um, and, you know, everyone expects us to help. Um, and just thinking about, one, I feel like there was an absence of Black trans women. Um, in the film and talking about that um, but like even when it comes to um, any movement I feel that black women um, 
are kind of the backbone of it. Um, and if you look at so many different movements, you see that like they're willing to help and they're willing to do um, and they're willing to risk so much. Um, but when it comes to so many other identities, it's like they're often forgotten whenever they need someone to do something or when they need someone to use their privilege. And I think that this would have been a great time for David France to use his privilege um, in helping a black woman. Um, and Raina Gossett is a black trans woman um, and she was working on a film and she did um, make the film, but like this would have been, been a great time for him to advocate and be like, look, you know, I'm working on this film and you want to put me on Netflix, but they're, there's also someone else working on it. So why don't you like put her in that space to be able to um, get her film on Netflix? And just, so just like thinking about different things like that, it's like, to me, for him to say, I'm willing to amplify the black voice um, and amplify, amplify the voice of um, black queer women and like, but you're not actually though. Um, and so just kind of thinking, of th thinking about that, um, kind of like, I don't know, like it makes me angry, I think, for the most part, but yeah. So I agree. You, you just, Skylar Bass, you just, because it's so, it's so like paternalistic and I'm the great conqueror and I'm the great, I'm going to just say it, I'm the great white cisgender man that's going to come in here and I'm going to save you yeah that save you right thank you uh, Scala, you should, that save your mentality like i'm the one that can come in no what you can do what you're not going to do is colonize what you're not going to do is, is buy my spirit experience and my soul and my body and everything all of who i am because you can't get it um why don't you take your privilege and actually i think you said it best use that to lift up you don't have to center yourself and make you could just do the work if, if you're that kind of ally, if you're really that kind of ally, why do you have to be in the center of it? Yeah, yeah. I saw this film, um, this, this documentary, Disclosure. And has anybody seen? Well, anyway, I saw that and I was really, that for me was at least, it's centered. There were women that were, you know, that were in there. And I'll tell you, full disclosure, since we're being informal, I discovered that an actress that I really loved for years, I had no idea that she was transgender. And that was an amazing, and that was an amazing thing for me on the one hand. On the other hand, I was like, and why didn't I? And now I'm beginning to ask questions about, you know, why, why is it that we don't have these experiences? And it's clear that she talks about playing the role of someone who was transgender, having to hide the fact that she was transgender. And I was like, wow, but that only comes out in a film. That only comes out when you have people who are actually doing, who are actually, that's their experience, that they are, that they come out and do that. And it's, it's shameful, it's shameful. Yeah. I feel like this is a like a microcosm of intersectionality, like at its finest, I think, like even when there's a movie about like gay liberation and like, like queer people, like it's still some, like even when it's supposed to be about a black trans woman, that's still the voice that's lost. It's still the experience that's lost. And um, like, and the like white savior aspect, like even in the film, Sylvia goes like, you're welcome for liberating you, which I think like, was just a quote that like stood out to me that didn't necessarily like sit right to me. Cause I don't think like, you know, like you didn't liberate all gay people and you had a lot of help with a black trans person who's not here with like with us anymore and like you're was still there in that moment um but yeah i just think like it's very interesting that kind of like what kessence was saying like somehow along the way it you know purposely black women in all every context are like forgotten about trans or otherwise and i just think that like it's just a shame so Does anyone else have any more comments or anything? Um, I just like, oh, oh go sorry. ahead. The willingness at the end, or at least like being confronted with, like whenever um, Victoria was having the discussion in her office, like we need to keep looking into this, keep pushing. And the person she was talking to was just like, well, we have so much 
on our plate. Like we have so many active cases right now. And just being like confronted with that, that conflict of like, well, Marsha deserves justice. Like all these people, even though it was in the past, deserve justice. And I think that's important, especially now to remember is because we're just so willing to like let things go and say it's the past, but we don't see where that connection of like injustice in the past is leaking into the continued injustice that's happening right now and how we have to confront that. We have to go back and address that before, you know, it, we can really see that come out and come to the present moment. So I thought that was really impactful. Um, uh, something that from the interview specifically that just really, to me, cause going back to David, um, the first question asked about like, what was the purpose of, you know, you creating this docu-series or this documentary and the first thing right off the bat he said i'm looking at the transcript is like marcia p johnson is about um or the life and death of Mar martha ooh, marcia p johnson is about a transformative figure from new york culture from the lgbt community in the 60s and uh as a central figure to the stonewall riots and a key player to building the modern lgbtq movement um and just like the sensationalization in a way that was like not wasn't it to me it wasn't a all-encompassing like description or it, that's not the best word to use right now but it just like very much so like she's just a key figure like that's it like there's nothing else there's not um it just to me was I, I didn't like the way it was worded with that and I feel like that's another part of the issue is like with a white cis man like talking about this or talking about someone's experience in a way that was just like oh a key figure like there's more to that there's a lot more to that okay yes I 100% agree and that is exactly where I was about to go because if you look at the article it says the reason why he chose to do this one of the things that he said was on my ideas wall, on my project wall, were her initials. And I thought, oh, well now would be a good time to start to do the story. So it's someone who's saying like, this person is my friend. Why, where was that emotional connection to it? Like it just seemed kind of basically similar to what you were saying, which is that this was just, they, he really found a way to, um, what's the diminute, make something smaller, can't remember the word for it. But um, it, it just really felt like there was a disconnect there to me. Yes, Prophet. Um, yeah, I love that point. Um, and I think like even whenever you say like that point, just also thinking if you're making a film about a black trans woman um, and her legacy, you would think that like he would include black trans women. And so I think that that's also an important conversation um, when we're talking about like proximity to whiteness as well and not just being white um, because he very well could have enlisted the help um, of Raina, Go Raina Gossett before he enlisted the help um, of anyone else and he didn't do that. And so it's just thinking about those different things. Um, and it just kind of sucks because I've, Sometimes I want everyone's intentions to be good. Um, and I think that people think that their intentions are good. Um, but there's just like a blindness with being white. Um, <laughs> and there's a blindness with having privilege that people just, it just makes it so hard, I think, to like really push a movement if they're at the forefront of that movement. Because they will always be blind to that. Um, until there is a, a voice like in that space to really combat that. So um, are there any last comments before we close out? Yep. Um, one thing I kind of keep going back to is like the film was called like the life and death of Marsha P. Johnson, but it kind of just seemed like it was about the death of Marsha P. Johnson and like, like after the film, um, 
but we were talking about like okay but like why didn't it talk about like what was Marsha doing at Stonewall why didn't it like follow her life as an activist and instead it kind of centered it around like the impact on mostly white um people of the queer community instead of um like Marsha's um life as an activist so yeah And then I also wanted to just um, just say, because I've been thinking a lot about this, about the, the people who tell our stories, right? Um, the fact that at this moment even, um, there's so many more quote unquote allies out there who have just learned about racism through George Floyd, um, not through Breonna Taylor, but through George Floyd, um, not through Sandra Bland, you know, um, and it's, it's so interesting because I was talking to my brother and sister, both of them live in England, and, you know, they're just automatically woke now, you know, and they look like me, like we're all black, um, and I've been, and they were like, yeah, so we need to, um, start telling stories of black people. I'm like, I'm a professor of Black's time. Um, but what really, what really frustrated me, and I love them a lot, you know, but what frustrated me was they had no idea where the Black Lives Matter movement came from. Like they didn't know it was three black trans women who started this movement. Um, no one knows, like Al Jazeera is covering this, but are they covering the fact that it was black trans women who started this, right? Um, they are not, and I and I feel like we're at a, we're at a, we're on a springboard now, you know, and and all these allies are with us, right? And they're going to springboard into into taking over this story as well, you know, and they're going to skew it, you know, based on their. Um, their new understandings, which are not deeply rooted at all, you know, and so I just think that um, something I've been thinking about a lot lately about who gets to tell the stories. Um, where do these stories go and what is the impact of, of the story when it is told by someone who um, has a different um, set of motives and a different agenda than just telling the truth, you know? So anyway, I can go on and on, but that's where, kind of where I am. Um, yes, I think there are amazing points being made. And I think like, sorry. Um, and I think in having this conversation, this isn't a conversation that I have a lot. Um, or maybe not like this in depth because I've learned a lot from this conversation. Um, and so I do want to thank everyone for their comments. I want to thank everyone for their knowledge um, because it did add a lot to the conversation. And with that being said, um, and there was a point in the group chat made about the list of names. Um, and so I do want everyone to go look at the, the list of names and just really think about like, no one's talking about them. Um, and it's so easy for black women, um, because it is a list of black trans women, um, for black women to be ignored, kind of casted out, um, forgotten. Um, and so I just want to make sure that like, after we leave this conversation, it's not just a conversation as well. Um, because there are cis people, there are trans people, there are black people, white people, people of color in this um, group. And so there are so many different avenues that we can take um, to continue to have this conversation. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all I have. I will be sending out more information. Um, but thanks everyone for coming. It really means a lot. Um, so yeah, I'll be sending out information. I'll be sending out an email today and information about um, the next one closer to the date. Um, so yeah, if anyone has anything else to say, I don't know if y'all do or not, but it is officially 5.30, so feel free to leave. Thank y'all. Well, I just wanted to say great job. And like, this has been an amazing conversation and an amazing turnout, because I think everybody knew it was going to be an amazing conversation. <laughs>
Yes, I, ditto. That's exactly what I was, yeah, you just, yeah. Yes, I've been what hearing about PSS yes. for a long time. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Have a good rest of your Sunday.